Good morning. We'll make you very welcome this morning in, in the name of our Lord Jesus. And if you're visiting with us today, we make you especially welcome. It's good to have you here, and we hope that uh, you'll enjoy your time with us. And if you're watching online, we hope that the Lord will bless you as you worship together with us. George is our speaker today, so we're looking forward to hearing what George has to say to us uh, from the word of the Lord today. A few announcements. After this service, we will continue on from this service to meet the Lord in his own appointed way. Uh, And if you know and love the Lord and you're walking in fellowship with him, we invite you to join with us, to remember him together with us. Our evening service is at 7 p.m. and George will be speaking again. We'll be meeting on Wednesday evening at 8 o'clock for prayer. And Rob Coulter will be taking that meeting. We hope that you'll come back and join with us to pray to the Lord and to uh, lift up your hearts to him. Our services next Sunday will be at uh, 11 a.m., 7 p.m. Uh, our speaker will be Keith Edgar. There'll be no summer Sunday school next week. Bally Walter Sism takes place this week. And if you can remember to pray for Adam and Debbie and Naomi and Ryan, who will be leading during the week. Adam will be here tonight to uh, say something more about it in the evening service. Uh, the Worldwide Missionary Convention is on uh, from the 19th to the 28th of August in Hamilton Road Presbyterian. Uh, this is just a preliminary announcement and there's, there's wee booklets are in the porch if you want to take one. You'll get all the details of uh, any other upcoming events in our our bulletin. And if you haven't got one of those, you'll get one on the porch on your way out. These are all the announcements, and we make them subject to the will of the Lord. I'm going to read a few verses from Isaiah chapter 55. Verses 1 to 3. Ho, everyone who thirsts, come to the waters. And you who have no money, come, buy and eat. Yes, come, buy wine and milk without money and without price. Why do you spend money for what is not bread and your wages for what does not satisfy? Listen carefully to me and eat what is good and let your soul delight itself in abundance. Incline your ear and come to me. Hear and your soul shall live. And I will make an everlasting covenant with you. The sure mercies of David. Are you thirsty this morning? I know many of you like to bring a bottle of water or a cup of water into the service to make sure you can sing okay and have your throats wet a wee bit. But I'm not talking about that kind of thirst. What I'm talking about is, are you thirsty for God? Isaiah speaks in what we just read as of having our uh, spiritual thirst quenched. He speaks of the satisfaction that's available in God alone. Jesus in John chapter 7 verse 37 cried out, If anyone thirst, let him come unto me and drink. Fulfilling what Isaiah said said in this uh, this chapter that Jesus is the one who satisfies. If you're not saved this morning, you know nothing of that satisfaction, but you will go about trying to find satisfaction in many other things. And I would urge you to trust in Jesus and know everlasting peace and contentment in God. Having our thirst satisfied, as mentioned many times throughout the scriptures, the last time being in the last chapter of the Bible, in Revelation 22, verse 17, where it says, The Spirit and the Bride say, Come, and let him that hears say, Come, and let him that is thirsty come, and whosoever will, let him take of the water of life freely. 
If you're saved this morning, this is a promise that our thirst is eternally satisfied in heaven. When we go to heaven to be with God, our thirst will be satisfied forever. Until then, our thirst is satisfied by the word of God and by the Holy Spirit, both of which are spoken of as being living waters. Our first hymn this morning is a plea that the Holy Spirit would open our eyes to understand what God would say to us through his word. And that hymn is, Open My Eyes That I May See. It's a hymn that we don't sing very often, but I hope enough of you know it to be able to sing it. Rachel was playing the tune earlier on, so hopefully we'll know it. Thanks, Rachel. We'll stand to sing. Let's continue in our worship of the Lord as we come to him now in prayer. Our great and our glorious God and our loving Heavenly Father, we praise you and we thank you for all your mercy and all your grace, all your love and all your kindness to us. Lord, we are wretched sinners born in sin and shaping in iniquity. And yet you, in your awesome kindness, have reached down into our world and sent your Son to be a substitute for us, to die on a cross and bear away our sins in his own body on the tree. We thank you, Lord, for all that you've done for us. We thank you, Lord, for saving us. And we thank you, Lord, for your word that you have so freely given to us that we can know your ways and know your truth and understand what you would say to us day by day. Lord, we pray as we gather here today 
that our hearts will be drawn out in worship, drawn out after you, to love you and to serve you. Lord, that we might find that satisfaction that Isaiah spoke of in your precious word by the power of your spirit. We pray, Lord, that we will all know the, the power of the spirit working in our lives today, that we will be able to understand what is spoken to us from your word. Lord, that you will make our minds clear. You will illumine our minds, Lord, to understand the words of truth. And Lord, we pray that George, as he comes to speak later, will also know that presence of the Spirit, helping him and strengthening him and guiding him in what he has to say. We pray, Lord, that you will bless all that happens here today. Lord, when what we sing, what we read, and what we hear, Lord, we pray that you will bless it to our hearts and that we'll bring glory and honor to your name. In Jesus' precious name, amen. There's, children, there's summer Sunday school for the children today, and Big John's going to come now and introduce that. Morning. Morning. Good to see you, sir. Just move that mic up a bit. Uh, so, yes, summer Sunday school starts uh, today. It's every other week, boys and girls. So you'll be glad to hear. You'll be going upstairs. Heather can't wait to come up and tell you the story as well. She's... She's biting at the bit there to get away. But uh, the story is, uh, we're taking all stories from the Gospel of Mark. So we're going to be looking at the first one today. And it's about this wee first we're going to learn later on. And it's a lovely wee first. It's from 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 7. And it says this here. Casting or giving all our cares to Jesus. Why? Because he cares for us. Isn't that amazing? Jesus cares for you. And we're going to sing a song and there's a, few actions, there's a few actions, Graham, I'm anticipating that you're coming up to give me a hand here after CEF and all. But it's, I'm just thinking, summer's great because schisms this week in Bally Walter, CEF happened in Port Stewart, all different things. And we must, must pray for the young children as they go along and hear about the Lord Jesus, that they would, for the, even for the first time, respond to that. And just in simple childlike faith, just say, yes, Lord Jesus, be my saviour. And that can be a prayer for you this morning, boys and girls. Just right now, you can say, yes, I want Jesus to be my saviour. Or my, men and women, uh, all, all us adults, we can just express that as well. We can talk to God. God longs for us to come to him and pray to him and talk to him about everything and anything. And he, he says he will answer. He hears and he will answer according to his will. So... Uh, I'll maybe get you, if you're able to stand, stand. Don't feel under pressure if you don't want to stand. And we want to sing this lovely song. Come on, Clive, now.
So summer Sunday schools for preschool right up to P7. Thanks. Let's come before the Lord in prayer again. Our loving Heavenly Father, again we give you thanks for all the children that are in our midst. And Lord, we pray for them as they go to summer Sunday school today that they will hear what you have to say to them, Lord. We pray that you'll bless Heather and those that are helping her as she teaches the children, Lord, the things of God. We pray, Lord, that they'll be touched by what they hear and that they'll be changed by what they hear. Lord, we thank you for the, the camp last week that Judith and Graham and Louise were at in Port Stewart, Lord, and we pray that you will continue to work in the lives of those children that heard your word there. And we pray, Lord, that we'll have the joy in days to come of hearing of children coming to know Christ as their saviour. Lord, we pray for all the the work that goes on among the children throughout the summer period and we would pray Lord for Bally Walter Sism in this coming week that you'll bless Adam and Debbie and Naomi and Ryan and all that are helping there Lord and we pray again that the word of God will be faithfully proclaimed Lord and that people's lives will be touched and Lord we pray too for other schisms that are happening later in the month and Lord we pray for Bally Home Sism we pray for Bethany as she will be involved in that there. We pray you'll help her, Lord. And we pray for Ewan, Lord, as he will be involved in the Port of Ogie schism. Lord, we just pray that you will bless in all these beach missions, Lord, that children will be reached in our land. And Lord, we pray too for Abigail as she will go to Donamana with the Baptist Youth Evangelism team. We pray, Lord, that she'll know your help. We pray it will be a time of blessing for her, Lord, that she'll be built up in her faith and that she'll be used by you, Lord, to um, bring your word to others. Lord, we remember too the camp that's going to be here shortly in, in the church, Lord, the Baptist Youth Camp. We pray for Karen and all the other leaders, Lord. We just pray that you'll help them all. And Lord, we pray that throughout all that happens throughout the summer, Lord, that, that many children will be reached. Lord, we know that many people are saved while they're children. And so, Lord, we pray that you will work in the hearts and lives of, of the children on this peninsula and further afield, Lord, and that you will bring many to saving faith in Christ. Lord, we pray for our own fellowship here. We pray, Lord, for those that are sick in our fellowship, Lord, and we just pray that you'll help them uh, in every way that they have need, Lord. We pray that you'll help those that are going through treatment, Lord, and those that have procedures to be done, we pray that they'll know your help, they'll know your nearness. And Lord, we pray that you will strengthen them with all might in the inner man. Lord, indeed, we pray that that would be the case for all of us as we live our lives day by day, that we will know your strength and your help in all that we do, that we might bring glory and honour to your name. And Lord, we pray for George and I as he will come shortly to take up your word and to speak to us from it and Lord we pray that he will know your help and we pray Lord that we will be uh, people who listen with careful ears Lord that we'll take on board what you say and that we'll, we'll not just be those that hear it Lord but we'll be those that do it and we pray Lord that through what happens here today Lord that your great name will be lifted high and that we will live lives that glorify you in the days and weeks that lie ahead. We ask all these things in Jesus' precious name. Amen. We're going to sing another hymn before George comes and speaks to us. George is starting a new series today on the book of Acts. And the book of Acts basically is the apostles uh, fulfilling the great commission of the Lord Jesus to uh, go forth and tell the gospel to others. And that's the hymn that we're going to sing just now. Go forth and tell, O church of God awake. And then George will come and speak to us. We'll stand to sing.
Well, it's lovely to see you this morning. You're very, very welcome. Thank you so much, Paul, for leading us. As Paul has said, we're going to start this morning to look at the Acts of the Apostles together. And if you could turn in your Bible to Acts chapter 1, and let's read the first 11 verses together. And then we're going to pray, and then we're going to look at that section of Scripture together. It would be really helpful if you can turn there and if you can keep your Bible open there. So let's hear God's word from Acts chapter 1, verses 1 to 11. In the first book, O Theophilus, I have dealt with all that Jesus began to do and teach until the day when he was taken up after he had given commands through the Holy Spirit to the apostles whom he had chosen. He presented himself alive to them after his suffering by many proofs, appearing to them during 40 days and speaking about the kingdom of God. And while staying with them, he ordered them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, you heard from me. For John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. So when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? He said to them, it is not for you to know times or seasons that the Father has fixed by his own authority. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. And when he had said these things, as they were looking on, he was lifted up. And a cloud took him out of their sight. And while they were gazing into heaven as he went, behold, two men stood by them in white robes and said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into heaven? This Jesus, who was taken up from you into heaven, will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. We know God will bless the reading of his word. We're going to pray together. And we're going to ask the Lord to bless and to help us as we study his word together. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the hymns that we have been singing together this morning, reminding us of what we have been commissioned and commanded to do by you, to go forth and tell. And we pray this morning that as we look at your word together, that we would be very conscious of the presence and power of God, the Holy Spirit. I pray for your help just now. Help me to communicate your word clearly, and I pray that you would speak to all of our hearts and use this message for the glory of God. In Jesus' name, amen. I know that some of you have brought a book with me, and some of you have read this book in the church. It's called In the Presence of My Enemies. And if you haven't read it, I'd really recommend that you do read it. It's a wonderful book. It's a book about the life of Gracia and Martin Burnham, who were missionaries, American missionaries. They were working with New Tribes Mission in the Philippines just over 20 years ago, whenever they were taken into captivity by a terrorist group. They were held in captivity for over one year. And it really was an horrendous time for them when they were held hostage. Uh, the terrorist group who, had, who were holding them captive had demanded money from the government of the United States of America in order to secure their release. And eventually some soldiers went in in an attempt to free and to secure them, uh, to secure their release and to free them. Uh, Gracia Burnham was shot and injured and Martin Burnham was shot and died immediately. Now, this book is all about their life in the jungle, about the hardship that they had to face. That's really a synopsis of the book. But there's a second book, there's a sequel. And the second book is entitled To Fly Again. And it's also about Gracie and Martin Burnham, but it's written from a different perspective because it's more about how Gracie coped with losing her husband 
about how she dealt with everything that she had to endure. And again, it's a fantastic book about the sovereignty of God. But as you look at those two books together, I have the second one with me. Lewis has the two of them. He's read them. As you look at those two books together, just a glance at the cover, you can see a close connection because it says Gracia Burnham and Dean Merrill, who is the co-author of both books. And so you can see a close connection. And if you've read those books, you'll know that there's a connection or heard about them. But I want to use that to introduce the book of Acts. Because maybe you haven't thought about the close connection between Acts and Luke's gospel. Maybe you have, maybe you haven't. But if you look at verse 1, you'll see that Luke mentions this in the very first verse. In the first book, O Theophilus, I have dealt with all that Jesus began to do and began to teach. Now the first book, of course, is the gospel of Luke. And if you want to turn to Luke's gospel, chapter 1, you'll notice that again, that Luke's gospel talks in the very first section there, in verse 3, about an orderly account that has been given to Theophilus. Now, we don't know who Theophilus was, and commentators have different views and opinions on that, but some people feel that he was a very important Roman official. We do know that his name means lover of God, And we do know that Luke wrote his gospel and he writes and he mentions Theophilus there at the beginning and he mentions Theophilus right here in the book of Acts right at the beginning. And of course Luke's gospel is an historical account. It's about Jesus' life. It's about Jesus' ministry. It's about the messages that Jesus preached. It's about the miracles that Jesus performed. It contains information about the birth of Jesus, about the life of Jesus, about the death of Jesus, about the resurrection of Jesus. And of course, if you read Luke chapter 1, just in the first few verses, you'll see that Luke's, Luke wants Theophilus in Luke 1 verses 3 and 4 to understand with certainty who Jesus is. And Luke wants others to understand who Jesus is, not just to know historical facts about Jesus, but to know Jesus personally as Savior and as Lord of their life. And then Luke's gospel concludes. And as it concludes, you can see that very clear connection to the Acts of the Apostles. If you want to turn to the very last chapter, to chapter 24 of Luke's gospel. Because you read there about Christ appearing to the disciples. And about Christ not only appearing to them, but Christ speaking to them. And about Christ eating with them. And notice that that Jesus says, Touch me and see, verse 39 of Luke 24, For a spirit does not have flesh and bones, as you see that I have. And he shows them his hands and his feet. And then as you read on down at the end of Luke's Gospel, chapter 24, you'll see that it says in verse 45, that he opened their minds to understand the scriptures. And he says, it's been written that Christ should suffer on the third day, rise from the dead, and that repentance and forgiveness of sin should be proclaimed in his name to all nations, beginning from Jerusalem. You can see the connection. And you're witnesses of these things. You can see the connection. I'm sending the promise of my Father upon you, but stay in the city until you're clothed with power from on high. So there's a very clear connection between the end of Luke's gospel and what we read together in Acts chapter 1. Now you'll notice in Acts chapter 1 that it says he presented himself, Jesus, verse 3, alive to them after his suffering by many proofs appearing to them during 40 days, which is what we read about a moment ago at the end of Luke, and speaking about the kingdom of God. And so this morning, while we have faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, it's not blind faith. We have faith based on historical facts. Jesus lived, Jesus died, Jesus rose, Jesus ascended. And there's irrefutable and indisputable evidence for that. And that's what Luke is saying here in Acts. He says, look, there are many proofs and proof that Christ appeared to the disciples alive. What was Jesus speaking about? He's speaking about chapter 1, verse 3, the kingdom of God. 
And he was continually speaking about the kingdom because there was still an element of confusion and false expectation with regard to Christ's kingdom that required clarification. You see, at that point of Jesus' ministry, Palestine was occupied by Romans. And for some people, their whole concept of a Messiah was that someone would come and deliver them and they would get out from under the cosh of the Romans. Someone would overthrow the Romans and set up and establish an earthly kingdom and a political kingdom. Now, Jesus has proved through his resurrection that his enemies didn't destroy them. He has proved that he defeated death itself. And so if you look at Acts chapter 1, verse 6, when they came together, they are asking, well, Lord, is this the time now? We realize that you're alive. Is this the time now that you're going to restore the kingdom to Israel? Is this when it's going to happen? They could reflect on periods of Israel's history when Israel had great prosperity and great power. And they're thinking, is this it right now? Is the kingdom here? Is it going to happen right now? They fail to understand what Christ's kingdom was really all about. They fail to understand that Christ's kingdom was not a political kingdom, not an earthly kingdom, but a spiritual kingdom. And as Jesus himself said in John's Gospel, chapter 18, verse 36, my kingdom is not of this world. If it were of the world, then I would fight for it. And as Jesus himself taught that in order to enter the kingdom requires a new birth, a spiritual birth, and that those who belong to Christ's kingdom are those who have Christ reigning and ruling over their lives, those who have submitted to his lordship and to his authority and to his leadership. So Christ is clarifying to the disciples and to the apostles what the kingdom is actually like. He's explaining to them that the kingdom is expanding and the kingdom is extensive. And the kingdom is something that goes way beyond the nation of Israel. It's a worldwide kingdom. And it's a kingdom that consists of people who have repented and received Christ as Lord and Savior of their lives. And so Jesus says to them in verse 7, it's not for you to know the times or the seasons that the Father has fixed. Listen, you're not to get caught up in all of that. It's not for you to understand that. That's not your primary responsibility. There is going to be a day when every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. But when that's going to happen, we're not exactly sure. We know it will happen. But Jesus says, here is your responsibility. Verse 8. And here's what you need to focus on. He said, you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the end of the earth. And so this morning, while we can see a connection between Luke's gospel and the Acts of the Apostles, and while we can see clarification about the type of kingdom that Christ establishes, a spiritual kingdom where people are born again to enter, we can see thirdly then that there is this command that Christ has given to his church. That the church are to continue to witness for the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm sure you, you've often thought about the fact that a great deal of what happens in the world that we live in today is really a continuation of what has gone in the past. If we take, for example, over a 50, 60 year period, something like a hospital, and someone who, who's medically trained may walk into a hospital today and they may recognize that there's been remarkable changes, remarkable advances in, in, in the way patients are treated and cared for and drugs that are available now that weren't available 50, 60 years ago. But really, if you consider the primary purpose of a hospital, there are still people there who are doctors and nurses who are caring for people who are sick. And they're helping those sick people to hopefully regain their health and to enable them to leave hospital at some point. So while there are some differences about the hospital, the primary purpose and the practice of the hospital is basically the same 
as it was 60 years ago. Now, if you were to take a school and a teacher walks into a school today, a teacher who taught school in a school a number of years ago, again, the teacher will see differences. There's a lot of technology available in school today that wasn't available 60 years ago. And yet, the principles are still the same. People are still receiving instruction and information. And teachers are trying to impart that to other pupils to enable them to grow in their knowledge and in their understanding. They're seeking to educate others. Now, while you may be here this morning and you understand the primary, the primary principle and purpose of a hospital or a school, it's really important that you understand the purpose of the church. What is the church doing? And what is it that the church ought to be doing? Well, the church is to continue to do what Jesus began. We know there's an element of Christ's work that is finished, his redemptive work. Christ himself said it is finished with regard to that. And yet there's so much of Christ's work that we need to continue to do and that we have been commanded and commissioned to do. How did the ministry of Jesus Christ begin? Well, it began when Jesus was baptized and when the Holy Spirit descended upon him. And then it says this in Matthew's Gospel, chapter 4. From that time, Jesus began to preach, saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. In other words, the central message of the church is to continue to send out that message that people need to repent and receive the Lord Jesus Christ in order to be truly a part of his church and to be ready and to be fit for heaven. And so while Acts speaks about a connection to the Gospel of Luke, while it speaks about clarification about the kingdom of God, it speaks about the command and the commission to the church and it speaks about the church continuing to do the work that God has called them to do. How deeply are you involved in that work? Are you praying that the church will develop and grow? That the Lord will bring people into his kingdom? That the kingdom will come? It seems that while hospitals and schools have changed over 50, 60 years, there has been a radical change in the church. We've seen churches pop up everywhere now. And there are lots of churches that are no longer called churches. You know, they're called the orchard, or they're given some other name. And I had a friend who, who went to one of these churches. It was a church plant. And as he went along to one of these churches, the way they structured their whole church service was different, very different to what he had been used to. And sort of people sat around coffee tables and they drank coffee and they had some food while uh, a group led them in, in their worship and praise and, and singing. And then someone got up to share from the Bible. And after he'd been attending that church, that group for a while, I I asked him what he felt about the church that he was attending. And he said, I begin to think about what it's really like, George. He said, it's attractional, but I'm not sure if it's missional. See, there's a difference. A church can be attractional. It's possible to have someone up front who's really charismatic, and it's possible to have musicians up front and and everything sort of bright and looks rosy and, and glossy. But it's only attractional. And if it's only attractional, then that's not enough. Because the church has to be missional. Because Christ came preaching a message of repentance. And the church has to be continually seeking to do what Christ did. In a book called The Upside Down, the Upside Down Church, a church pastor called Greg Laurie has an acronym for the church, for the health of the church. He calls it 
It's, it's the well church. Just think about that acronym for a minute. The church that is well, according to Pastor Greg Laurie, is a church that is worshipping, a church that is evangelizing, a church that is loving, and a church that is learning. Worshipping, evangelizing, loving, and learning. Those are the marks of a well church. So how do you view the church this morning? Is the church well? Because you see, God has set things in place for the continuity of his church. He promised to build his church. And and not even the gates of hell can prevail against that. And God has set these things in place for the spread of the gospel. And that happened first through the apostles. Who were eyewitnesses of the miracles of Christ. Who were present during Christ's life. And who of course were eyewitnesses of the resurrection of Christ. And they were sent by God on a mission. And the miracles that those apostles performed were proof that they had been sent for God, by God. And they played such a fundamental and foundational role in the life of the early church and still today. Because it says in Ephesians 2 that you are fellow citizens with the saints and you're members of the household of God. You are built on the foundation of of the apostles and the prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. In other words, what the apostles and prophets taught is foundational and fundamental for the life of the church. And if you turn over a page to Acts 2.42, you'll see that the well church in the book of Acts, the healthy church, the church that was certainly worshipping, evangelizing, loving and learning, in Acts chapter 2 verse 42 are doing something. They're devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching, to fellowship, to breaking of bread and to prayer. And so God is continuing his work today through believers, through the church today. He is continuing to build his church through prayer, through people, and through the proclamation of his word. And so the Acts of the Apostles speaks of continuity when it comes to the church. But it also speaks, doesn't it, about our responsibility, verse 8. Because it says, you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in the place where Jesus was rejected and crucified. You will be my witnesses. That's where it was all to begin. Now, what is a witness? A witness is very very simply someone who testifies about what they have seen and what they have heard. If you imagine that, you witness a crime that's been committed. And you're the only person who has witnessed that crime. Well, to ensure that the perpetrator of that crime is properly punished, then you need to give evidence. You just have to simply present the facts. You talk about what you have seen, what you have heard, and about what you know. And if you ever have to go to court to be a witness, you don't have to have any, any other experience apart from the experience of what you have had seen and heard. You don't have to be a barrister. You don't have to be a lawyer. You're a witness. And you simply speak about what you've seen and heard. Now, that was certainly happening in the early church. And what we need to understand is that in verse 4 of chapter 13 that people actually saw the boldness of Peter and John. They were witnessing the power of Christ in Peter's life and in John's life. And they perceived that they were uneducated. That is, they hadn't been to any of the rabbinical schools. They were common men, but they were astonished. And they recognized that they had been with Jesus. How is that so? Because their lives were saying something. And this morning, you see, your life is saying something. Your life actually speaks. But you have a far more important 
role than just simply giving evidence in the court of law. Jesus says, you are my witnesses. Now the apostles initially were witnessing for Christ. But all believers are witnessing. And you're either a good witness or you're not a good witness. But you have, if you're a Christian, then that experiential knowledge of what it is to know that your sins have been forgiven. And it's your duty to tell others what Christ has done in your life. Because just as evidence in a courtroom can bring light and bring a benefit and blessing, then your testimony about Christ can bring blessing to other people who have not yet heard but who need to acquire a knowledge and to have understanding of who Jesus actually is. I read some time ago about a lady who lived in Southern Ireland who went to work in America for a period of time. She was working in an, as a nanny and she was caring for a number of children. And then one of the children that she was caring for actually died while she was caring for the child. And the police began to investigate the circumstances surrounding the child's death. And they discovered that this particular lady, although she was working in America, she didn't have a proper visa to work there. And suddenly they were suspicious. And they arrested this woman and they accused her of shaking this child violently and that that was the cause of the child's death. And she was sent to prison. But some time later, someone came forward with evidence. Evidence that that child had an underlying medical condition. And that the child's death was not caused by what people had initially thought. And that evidence was sufficient to enable that lady to leave prison and to find liberty, and to find life. Now very often when people present the facts about Jesus, when they present the evidence for Jesus that he lived, that he died, that he rose again, that he is the only means of eternal salvation, people benefit. People find blessing. People find life and people find liberty in the Lord Jesus Christ himself. And the Bible says in the book of Romans, chapter 10, verse 9, that if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and you believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Because a testimony can have a very, very powerful impact on influence on other people. It can prevent wrongful imprisonment and of course, to testify of Christ has the power and the potential to transform lives. And so in verse 8, Jesus has said to these people, You will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. And we know that the gospel spread from there. We know that an earthquake has an epicenter. And we know that although the earthquake, the epicenter may be here, that there is a spread, but it's with a very negative effect and a destructive effect. But with regard to the gospel, it spread with a very positive effect. It was so powerful, and you notice in verse 8 that it says, you shall receive, you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And, and, and the word power there is the word from which we derive our word dynamite. It's the same word that Paul uses in Romans 1 when he talks about the gospel, Romans 1.16, which is the power of God unto salvation to, for everyone who believes. It's dynamic. It's exceptionally powerful. And so the gospel spread in such a way that when you read on through in the Acts of the Apostles, you'll read in Acts chapter 17, verse 6, that they turned the world upside down. 
Everything was changed because of the power of the gospel that went forth. And it says in Acts 8 verse 4, those who were scattered, they went about preaching the word. Someone said recently they were, they were gossiping the gospel. They were sharing the word of God. And so we can see a connection in Acts. We can see clarification with regard to Christ's kingdom. We can see this command that Christ has given to the church. We can see continuation of what the church ought to be doing. But where is it that we actually get the power to be effective witnesses from? Well, God is the source of all authority and of all power. And you'll notice in verse 8 that Jesus says, You will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. Now, if you look at verses 4 and 5, you'll see that they're staying in Jerusalem for that period. In fact, they've been ordered not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father. So although they may have been filled with enthusiasm and excitement to go out and proclaim this message, they're actually told that they need to pause and they need to wait. Because the one thing that the church needs in order to have an effective witness and to see conversions is the power of God, the Holy Spirit, at work within the lives of individuals and within the life of a church corporately. And so they've been told to wait for the promise of the Father. Now we know from John's Gospel that just prior to Jesus' death in John 14, Jesus told his disciples, I will ask the Father, he will give you another helper to be with you forever, verse 16. Even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it neither sees him nor knows him, you know him, for he dwells with you and will be in you. I will not leave you as orphans, Jesus said. I will come to you. We know from chapter 15, verses 26 and 27, Jesus said, When the Helper comes, whom I will send to you from the Father, the Spirit of truth who proceeds from the Father, he will bear witness about me. And you also will bear witness because you have been with me from the beginning. And in the next chapter of John, chapter 16, verses 7 and 8, again we read about the work of the Holy Spirit. Because we read there, Jesus says, I tell you the truth, it is to your advantage that I go away, for if I do not go away, the Helper will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. And when he comes... He will convict the world concerning sin, righteousness, and judgment. Now, the early church were going to partake of that power in just a few days. We read about that in chapter 2, when the Holy Spirit would come at Pentecost. So there's a very definite purpose that God gave them this power. They needed his power in order to do the Lord's work. They needed his power to walk worthy of the calling with which they had been called. They needed his power to be effective in their witness. Why are we so dependent on the power of the Holy Spirit? Because naturally, people cannot understand the gospel. Naturally, people are dead in their trespasses and in their sins. Naturally, people have their minds darkened by Satan himself. And only God the Holy Spirit can illuminate the hearts and the minds, cause conviction of sin, and cause conversion to the Lord Jesus Christ. That's why Jesus said that people had to be born again of water and the Spirit in order to enter the kingdom of God. What does the church desperately need today? We desperately need the power of God to be present and the word of God to be faithfully proclaimed in every place possible that we can proclaim it. That is what we need. Now it says right here in verse 5 that John's baptism was a baptism of water. John immersed people with water. But you will be immersed, you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit Not many days from now. Now throughout the Old Testament. You will read about people like Gideon. 
you will read about people like Samson. And it said of, of Samson that they could not restrain him. Remember how they tie, tried to tie Samson up and he, he just snapped those ropes off him just like that. So powerful. What, how, how did he do that? Well, the Bible says in Judges chapter 14, verse 19, that the Spirit of God came upon him. The Spirit of God enabled him to have supernatural physical strength. <clears throat> And so what Jesus is saying to the disciples is, you are going to receive the Holy Spirit not many days from now. And so every believer in the Lord Jesus Christ has now the Holy Spirit permanently indwelling them. There's confusion about that. I had someone came, come to me once and, and he said, you know, George, someone came to me recently and said, whenever I was would be baptized with the Holy Spirit, I could speak in tongues. Well, there's nothing about that in the Bible. Nothing about that. Here's what it does say. 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Just as the body is one and as many members, that's the church, and all the members of the body, though many are one body, so it is with Christ. In one spirit, we are all baptized into one body. So you have the Spirit of God if you belong to the Lord Jesus Christ this morning. And that's important because there's a lot of confusion out there about when the Holy Spirit comes. The Spirit convicts, the Spirit converts, and the Spirit indwells every believer. Here's what it says in Romans 8 verse 9. You, however, are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if in, sp if in fact... The Spirit of God dwells in you. Anyone who does not have the Spirit of Christ does not belong to him. Now, if my friend would have known Romans 8 verse 9, he could very easily, very easily have answered that question. Every believer has been baptized into the body of Christ. Now, we need to be repeatedly filled with the Spirit. Ephesians 5.18, you're not to be drunk with wine, which leads to debauchery, but you're to be filled with the Spirit. That happens repeatedly. And incidentally, as you read the book of Acts, you will read that when people were filled with the Spirit, you know what they did? They spoke boldly about Jesus Christ. They testified about Christ. They witnessed. They shared the gospel because they were filled with the Spirit. So you have a number of things in Acts chapter 1. You have a connection to Luke's gospel. You have clarification about the kingdom of God. You have the church commanded and commissioned to be witnesses for Christ. You have this continuity in God's work in reaching the world. And you have finally then, and just want to mention this, you have finally the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. Here's why you need to share the gospel. Verses 9 through to 11. When Christ was lifted up and ascends into heaven, it says two men stood there in white robes and said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into heaven? This Jesus, who was taken up from you into heaven, will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. Jesus will return. Jesus will return. And the Bible says in Revelation chapter 1 verse 3 that the time is near. We're not called to continually look into heaven. We're not called as a church to, to try and work out exactly wh what date or what year or what time Jesus might possibly return. We're called, commissioned and commanded to continue to do God's work and to reach people with the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what the church is called to do. So may God help us by his grace and enable us by the power of the Holy Spirit to do that as we seek to serve him together for his glory and for the extension of his amazing kingdom. Our closing hymn will, will sort of emphasize what we've been thinking about this morning. Church, arise, put your armor on, hear the call of Christ our captain. And let's stand together 
as we worship God together and we praise him. Father, we thank you for the immense privilege of being part of your church. We thank you for your grace and your kindness in all of our lives. We pray, God, that you would enable us and empower us, even in the incoming week, to be good witnesses, to help us to be effective and efficient in the work that you've called us to do as your people. We pray that you would bless each head bowed in your presence. Encourage and edify and strengthen your people spiritually, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen.